by posing a question to all of you. Um, out of the three, if you had to pick one, uh, which would be the one you would pick that tells the most vivid story? Would it be words, music, or images? Let's start with you. Images. Why? I think, really actually, I think all three could be utilized based on the person doing it. But for me, words are like a trap that I can't express emotion through. Images are easier to respond to and have a more human connection to, for me. All right, we've got one point for images. Words, music, or images, which one? Mine would definitely be music, because I think not only does it tell a story using words, but it also creates some mental image in your mind. University of North Carolina. South Carolina. South Carolina. South Carolina. Yes, sir. Which one? Words, music, or images? Which one speaks to I would to you? say music, due to the fact that words or images can be misconstrued from different people, different perspectives, whereas music can be more like at the tone, be like more understood by a general population. That's it. So, like, like, vivid as in, like, they would match up more with different people. All right. I would say they all complement each other, but I would go with picture. So, would that be images? images. And why it's images? worth a thousand words. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, music as well. And why music? Uh, well, I feel that um, you're less restrained. Like, you don't have something in front of you or words that's just like, well, because when I listen to music, I never listen to words. I more like listen to the instrument and stuff. So I think it's easier to interpret, like, can all have like different interpretation. I guess it's easier for me. <coughs> yes, sir. It's the words. Winston tastes good like a shake. See that shit. Pictures worth a thousand words, but it's the words that remembered and the pictures that are forgotten. And if you add music to the words, then you got something really going on. <laughs> Mr. Patterson, words, music, or images? Well, you know, I'm gonna go with images. I'm a visual person, so. And because? I'm a visual person. So I uh, tend to um, see more than an uh, image, whether it be um, <clears throat> paintings or photography. Yes, ma'am. And images, visual, with, but you have to have the music <coughs> overlay or underlay, but visual, images, because you feel. It makes you feel. Just you absorb what you're looking okay. or at least I do. Yes, ma'am? I think the, the key part of the question is in telling a, sh a, a story rather than sharing an experience. So I'd go with words because it's easier to convey the storyteller's intent. Yes, ma'am? Um, I would go with images because, like, too, I'm a visual person. I learn visually better. And then also, I mean, if you look at a picture long enough, you can tell the story behind it. I would say all three complement each other, so it's kind of hard to say which one would be the better uh, option. I mean, if I had to choose, I'd probably say images, but I feel like even with music and uh, with words as well, it's kind of like based off your own interpretation. So somebody might look at it and have a different perspective. It wouldn't be the same as like French or something. What's your perspective? I'm an English professor. <laughs> so professional ethics uh, demands that I say words. <laughs> but I follow this up by, by observing, and this is very interesting. I mean, it's a very interesting question. St. Augustine, who did so much to shape medieval thought, you know, writing in, in late antiquity, he's writing about the words in the uh, Bible. And he, he explains to his, to his readers that each of these words is like a picture insofar as it's a sign. That is, it points to something else. So, um, you know, if you imagine, say, a, a kind of photorealist oil painting of, of yourself, you know, where somebody comes into the room and says, oh my gosh, that, you know, there's Irvin. Um, that that picture 
only has meaning as an image of you with reference to the person who you you actually are. And this was this was Saint Augustine's point about about words. That um, and I think you know uh, people in the in the Eastern tradition, um, you know Chinese uh, pictographs. Uh, as opposed to the uh, the alphabet that, that we're familiar with, they're more sensitive to the fact that words really are, in a sense, pictures, and and that pictures, in order to be understood, have to be understood. You know, somebody was talking about narrative out here. You know, every every picture I look at implies a story for me, and um, you know, there's this wonderful kind of synergy between between words and pictures. Now music, now this is your area of expertise, so I'm going to be very careful about what I say. Um, One of my great regrets in life is that I never learned how to read music. So over at Tulane we have, you know, a number of medieval manuscripts, not this one that I brought with me today, alas, but um, we do have a number of medieval manuscripts that have music musical notation in them. So, you know, if I were to show one of those manuscripts to Urban, I mean, you might be able to, um, you know, mentally not just read, but, but translate that, that image into, into song. Whereas for me, you know, it remains a, a kind of visual code. I, I know it's a code that means something, you know, so that if I have, you know, somebody who knows something about medieval plain chant or, or polyphony, look at it and, and try to sing it, that they're going to be able to um, interpret it. But for me, it remains just a kind of static, you know, visual image on the page. So, so, so music for me is, um, you know, it's more mysterious than, um, than words or, or pictures, in part, you know, due to my own ignorance concerning musical notation. Um, but also I think because there's a, there's a level of suggestion possible in music, which is not always possible in pictures or words, not always possible. So in the Middle Ages, they, I'm a, I'm a medievalist, so I'm always thinking about things in terms of how they might have thought about them in the Middle Ages. They said there was a hierarchy of the senses, the five senses sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. The highest senses are sight and hearing. So they connected very naturally um, pictures and reading and the sound of, of, of music. They thought of them, as, as one of your students pointed out, as, as being all, you know, all, all together of a, of a piece. You know, they appeal to pictures, words, music are all alike in that they appeal to the higher part of our of our souls. Okay, few more, few more here. How about you? Wish you didn't ask me that question, huh? <laughs> no, it's great. Actually, if you look at our poll, images is winning by one. Everyone ah. else is tied. Okay, so let's go with uh, the best way for you personally to feel like love has been communicated. Mm. If you had to pick between words, music, and images, you would pick. I think love has only been communicated to me in words, so I'd have to go with words. Music. Music. And that's a, a very interesting question. I just have to elaborate on a second because I think love is emotional. Mm. And so what is, how do you express things emotionally? Uh, poets are able to put it in words. Musicians are, uh, myself, I, I mean, I look at love, and it, there is music to that. Um, image, uh, to a lesser degree, when, when, it, when mm. it comes to, to mm. love. But uh, you, you show love, too. But I, I would have to go with music in this particular case. I think that you guys are forgetting just a couple of things about image with that. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I, I honestly don't well, Probably music, too, again. Now, you guys are just trying to... (laughs) 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 You you know, you you say which is the strongest. And to me, like like everybody said, 
the three can all promote this. I mean, being a radio guy, I gotta go with words. And then, you know, it's the lyrics of the music that's got a high memorable factor. So even with love, though, I have to say words. Okay. Yes, ma'am, in the green. Um, music. Music is winning, hands down. <laughs> well, let's see, sir. Does mine get like 10 uh, votes or something? How many is it? Well, words has two, music has <laughs> five, images has zero. <laughs> In that case. I'm, I'm, I'm still going with music. Um, you know why. Actually, you explained it to me why. So. But what do you think? Well, music, um, you said I think uh, music uh, holds the same place as emotion or something like that. What was it? What was the quote? Well, I'm not giving my opinion just yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. I'm torn. Image in that words really is probably my number one thought, except image and visual, you look at words. So when you're looking and reading the words, you're feeling, hence the visual. And of course, the words in music, love songs, kind of all is the same set to music, which is fabulous. So I don't know. <laughs> you have to pick one. I guess I'll go with visual. I'm going to go with words or containers for meaning. So, words. That's good. I'm going to go with words. Because <clears throat> kind of I would say music, because music definitely makes me feel. But I probably would end up going with the words as well because I guess words have like, to me, it feels like it has like a deeper meaning, well, depending on how the person is conveying the message. That's interesting because when you look at uh, most of the promotion uh, for, for advertisements that want to evoke love, it's heavy, it's heavy on the image side. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you want to evoke love, um, you could simply show a mother picking up a baby. Mm. Um, you can show people all sitting around at Christmas at the table smiling, right? Uh, the TV volume's down, you know, no words have been shown and someone picks up a Coke can and they drink. That means I love Coke, mm. right? So it's, it's interesting on, on that one. Okay, here's my final one that we're going to get started. And this is important, especially for the things that we're dealing with right now. Tragedy. And when we think of tragedy, um, a bunch of guys get some weapons, show up in uh, a print media office, and assassinate a bunch of folks because they feel like their religion was offended. Or uh, someone wants to convey that a police officer did kill a guy by choking him. Or uh, someone wants to convey that they think uh, a young man was, life was taken unjustly. Or someone wants to discuss uh, folks not having their civil rights. Uh, someone wants to convey a, uh, something that negatively impacted them and their community and neighborhood. Uh, what are the ways um, that tragedy is represented best? Um, and tragedies can also be thought of as responses to it. Most revolutions are responses to tragic situations. You can think of many religious stories uh, that speak of different types of revolutions that are responses. Uh, and of course, I'm just setting the foundation for where you're going <laughs> to take us to in a minute. Uh, but let's go, um, you know, tragedy is best communicated through words, music, images. I actually went to Exhibit B, have y'all been to that? Like this yeah. past weekend? And I guess it was like portraying all the tragedy. And I would say that although there was a lot of words there, the images are within the most. Mm. Like even the words, like how they were written, or where they were written, where they were choose to be portrayed, was like the way that it was best communicated. So images. Images again. 
<coughs> yeah. Images. I, I mean, I can just vividly remember the Passion of the Christ. And you, and you heard about it, but when you saw it, you were just like, oh my. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Same. Same? Damn, music is... <laughs> <laughs> you, sir? Well... <laughs> I'm going with images. Every time I think of uh, any tragedy, I always remember like what I saw. Like September 11th, I remember the building. You know, it's, it's all about the image. Absolutely. Images. I'm going to be a little bit contrary. Okay. Um, I actually work in tragedy, essentially. Um, Tell me, well, what, I, what are you working? I, I work in disaster response for a veteran service nonprofit. Mm. So, two, two simultaneous tragedies okay. uh, being solved. So, while I agree that images are powerful and memorable, um, I think words in this instance actually have a few kind of distinct advantages. On one hand, uh, words can put you more into the soul of, let's say, a survivor of a tragedy um, than an image can, where you're viewing it almost as, as essentially through a lens. Um, and at the same time, the limitation that words have and the limitations that we have as humans using words to express our feelings about tragedy can also be a benefit. There, there will never be the exact perfect words to fully describe the scope of something like the Charlotte Hebdo massacre or September 11th, but that's because this is something that shouldn't be able to be fully described and comprehended. So, right. words. Images. I'm just gonna go with the obvious answer. <laughs> Don't just go along with the, <laughs> no, I mean, the group it, peer pressure. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it just makes sense to me. Images make sense. Well, I mean, I think um, I'd have to say images as well. Although your student who made the observation concerning concerning words, you know, that's that's interesting because you know, from my point of view in, in the great literary tragedies, and I think the greatest one is, is King Lear, you know, Shakespeare's King Lear. At the end of that play, um, you know, Lear, who has suffered, you know, in extremis for, for the course of a two-hour play, um, he walks on stage with his daughter's dead body in his arms. And, and he's just howling with, with grief. So he's, he's using his voice but he's not using it um, in the kind of articulate way, you know, that we we would think of, say, you know, speaking with a therapist about a, a trauma that we've suffered or 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 witnessed. He's he's giving expression by way of his voice to the inability of language alone to to capture the essence of, of human suffering. Uh, somebody mentioned 9-11. I still remember where I was when I first heard about what was going on in New York that day. My son was in the Cub Scouts, and I was the Cub Master over at Lusher School uptown, and uh, I had to run into the school office to uh, drop off some, some flyers for the other Cub Scouts, and the principal, Kathy Reidlinger, was on the front steps. And she looked concerned. I said, what's the matter? And she said, someone's just flown a plane into one of the uh, World Trade Center towers. And you know, neither of us knew what all that was about at that time, because it was happening in, in real time, that, that, that great tragedy. But I remember the incredible silence on the front steps of, of the school building as she said that to me and as I took it in and as we both looked at each other and thought, you know, something terrible is, is happening that, that we don't fully understand. So, um, you know, again, although it's a cop-out in terms of your survey, I think, um, you know, as humans, we're, and, and this is the great experience of literature for me, you know, it's not just words on the page. 
its images, its sounds. Um, you know, it's really uh, a multimedia phenomenon. You know, uh, getting involved in a in a poem, in a short story, in a in a novel, seeing a play, and you know, that's one of the. I've been teaching literature to uh, college students since 1979, and it's always brand new to me. You know, it's always brand new the way I'm sure a piece of music is to you when when you play it again. You know, especially one that you've really practiced and, and uh, care about. You know, it never gets old. It's mm -hmm. it's brand new, and it's new because it's so rich. You know, it doesn't appeal literature or music to to just one one dimension of our of our sensual natures you know everything comes into play and that's that's really uh, that's one of the great things about it you know. so words words you know I'm a word man I, I have to be <laughs> <laughs> no need to be political here right now <laughs> that's right okay I was gonna end there but because both are so wildly different I have to ask a third uh, if we look at love Music wins hands down. We look mm. at tragedy images. So now I'm going to go with our final one, which would be what makes you laugh? Comedy. Mm. Where is music and images? Pick one. Her. I guess images. Might be words. Mmm. Traitor. <laughs> words and the family irony. Oh, see where this is going. <laughs> I would say word first and images. Well, you can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> is it words or is it not, right. sir? I, I mean, you hear a joke or some conveying. Yeah, words? Word, word. You guys are traitors. <laughs> I'll go with words as well. Yeah, so. <laughs> I can't wait till we get to you because I know you're going to cry. Words. You know, I, can I say something? Absolutely. Um, I'm in the radio business, and the two top testing songs ever were both love songs. Hmm. Righteous Brothers' Unchained Melody is the number one testing song, followed by Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Oh, wow. Led Zeppelin? Really? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Words. And words. Sir. Sir. Um, words. I'm going to throw it off, but I'll say images just to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say words, but I have to ask a question. Yes. Have any of y'all seen, and this is totally visual, the video of the cop, the Delaware cop, the viral video of him doing the whole ex word, first to stop, end of, beginning to end, of Taylor Swift's song, um, I can't think of the name. Uh, Nobody has seen that video. Shake it off. Shake it off. It is the funniest, and you cannot see that. You could see it. When I first saw it, it was silent. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. hear the music. You could just see him. And he is driving his car, and half the time he takes his hands off the way. You can tell he's really driving. He is so into that, and he knows every single solitary word, and he acts it out while he's driving this car. I can't believe you. You have to look that up. It is so <laughs> he's your next. He's your next That's guest. Really <laughs> then you listen to it and you laugh again. Mm. So y'all have to look this up. It was funny without the. Uh, totally. The first time I saw it, I didn't have any sound because I was. <laughs> doing, <laughs> I was in a meeting. I couldn't listen to it. Okay. Words. <clears throat> no commentary. <laughs> Let me down. Images. I can buy it. I'm going with images as well. Thank you for you. Wow. So, love, music wins, tragedy, images, and comedy or words. Hmm. That brings us to our guest today. Michael Kaczynski is an associate professor, professor and chair in the English department at Tulane University. He teaches medieval poetry and book history to graduate and undergraduate students and recently initiated a community collaboration program, Archives and Outreach, designed to introduce local high school teachers and students to
to Tulane's rich archival resources and their connections with New Orleans history and culture. He also regularly teaches a seminar, Medieval New Orleans, that introduces students to the influence of the 19th century medieval revival on our city and its communities. So how about a round of applause for our guests? Thanks, Irvin. I want to officially thank you for taking your time from the institution that pays you to come to uh, talk to us a little bit. Well, they pay me to, uh, to reach out and uh, you know, get the word out to, uh, to other folks off campus about what we're doing in the English department, what we're doing in the School of Liberal Arts, which is the school that the English department belongs to at Tulane, and what we're doing at the, at the university. So um, it's great to, uh, great to be with you. Of course, we've been together recently uh, planning projects, so, uh, right. but it's great to see you in your uh, pedagogical <laughs> context here as a, as a teacher. Let's start off with 19th century medieval experiences. Right. Uh, what makes the 19th century medieval experience interesting and sexy? Well, one of the things that, that happened to the Middle Ages after the medieval period was over around 1500 or so, uh, was that it was forgotten because um, the Renaissance, as it used to be called, now called the early modern period by scholars, uh, was, was concerned with recovering the literature, Latin and Greek literature of the classical past. And Renaissance writers look down their noses at the Middle Ages. In fact, you know, the term um, medieval, you know, the phrase Middle Ages in, in Latin medium avum means a kind of cultural pothole <laughs> in between the classical age and the Renaissance, a period when, well, you, you know, you've probably heard of the Middle Ages called the Dark Ages. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there was a, a book written by a historian a few years ago entitled a world lit only by fire. And of course that title implies that there was no wisdom, no knowledge, no, no sensitivity, uh, you know, no, no cultural awareness in, in this period that extended from the 8th through the, uh, through the 15th centuries. So the Middle Ages um, fell out of favor after 1500 or so and at least European society began this march in the direction of rationalism and empiricism. You know, the 18th century is the age of reason, the, the enlightenment. Um, with the 19th century, however, and the industrial revolution, um, the Middle Ages came to be revisited by, um, by scholars as a, as a kind of cultural critique of what was going on in industrialized Europe. Um, you know, industrialism is concerned essentially with maximizing production or manufacturing and consolidating profits. So it leads to, you know, what most of us would regard as a kind of unjust society. Uh, and a and a denigration of the human in favor of the technological. So in response to, to these kinds of developments in, in Europe and in England specifically, uh, certain scholars returned to the Middle Ages as a kind of um, utopian cultural space as they imagined it. Now, now, of course, the Middle Ages they were imagining and, and romanticizing it was not the real Middle Ages. You know, we, we have a very limited access to what the Middle Ages was really like. Um, nevertheless, uh, figures like in, in England, uh, William Morris, for instance, who was um, born an aristocrat, became a socialist, uh, championed a return to medieval crafts, uh, medieval art forms, the handmade book. Um, art critics like John Ruskin, um, who uh, were concerned with preserving Gothic and Romanesque architecture in, 
in places like Paris and, and Venice on the continent. You know, these figures, they saw in the Middle Ages a time when the human person, human achievement, uh, the artistic impulse that is present even in, you know, people who, um, you know, engage in, in craftsmanlike activity like building chairs, tables, uh, you know, putting up buildings. You know, they, they saw that as, um, as a way, uh, you know, paying respect to that, reviving that as a way of, of um, reviving uh, human sensitivity during the industrial age. And I think they were right to, uh, to return to the Middle Ages for that kind of inspiration. You know, they, they really thought of, of the Middle Ages, the, the bits of it that survived, like medieval books, like this one that I brought today, or medieval buildings, you know, which still survive in, in Europe and, and in England. You know, they saw them as, um, as physical manifestations of the human spirit, the human desire to, to transcend itself. When you think about um, the notion of someone making something with their bare hands yeah. Yeah. versus um, one design for all. The, the mass, mass production. Mass, mass production. production. And, yeah. and, and uh, let's call it uh, for lack of a better term, perfection. Yes. And if you can make, you know, the same chair, we've agreed that this is the chair we want to make. Yes. And right. every chair will be the same. Right. And perfect. Right. Versus a chair made by hand. Yes. Would be imperfect, and every chair would be different. Correct. Um, is that a better lens to look at things through? Is that more authentic? Is, so is the Gothic experience, is the medieval experience more authentic than uh, the Industrial Revolution? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, mass production, um, and you were asking about comedy earlier, one of my favorite films is Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times because it's a, you know, it's just a fascinating visual critique of, of modern mass production. There's this scene where, I don't know if you've seen the movie where, you know, Chaplin, the, the little tramp, he gets caught in the gears of the uh, machine that he's fixing in the factory, and he's just kind of, you know, moved throughout uh, this machine by these by these massive gears, and you know that's that's Chaplin's image in that movie for the triumph of the machine over the human. You know what people like Morris and Ruskin saw in the Middle Ages when they looked at a medieval manuscript, when they looked at a medieval building. Um, you know, you walk into the great cathedrals today, as I have the opportunity to do when, you know, I go to England to, to do my research on medieval books, and you walk through there and you're not looking at, at perfect buildings. You know, you go up to uh, the walls, to the sculptures in there, and you can still see the, the tool marks, you know, on the carvings that, uh, you know, from where uh, a workman applied, you know, his hammer, his chisel back in the 14th century. You know, these are not perfect buildings by, by any means. You know, if you set them alongside of a, um, you know, say, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If you think about, you know, Independence Hall, you know, this 18th century Georgian building, you know, with all of its symmetry and balance, you know, they look irregular next to a building like that. But there's something really, you know, comfortably human about uh, the sense that you get of, um, you know, the workman actually having impressed on the material something of his character, something of his passion, something of what uh, William Morris called his pleasure in labor. This was the thing about, about the Middle Ages that, um, and of course, as a musician, um, you know, you have the, you know, the, the privilege of doing for your work something that you're, you, you know, you're passionate about and, and take great pleasure in. This is one of the advantages to being a teacher as well. Um, you know, Morris said that after the end of the Middle Ages, there was this gradual, as, as, as society moved through the Industrial Revolution, you know, a kind of divorce between a person's labor and that person's taking pleasure in it. 
can you name one item that you have that's handmade? Yeah, ceramic objects, so cups and bowls. Mm. Most of my dresses. Not sure. Not one? Sorry. Not one comes to mind? It's handmade? No. Handmade. That necklace you're perhaps wearing? Doubt it. Yeah. I want it makes like beanies and scarves, mm. but I don't know. But you don't have any? No. I think everything's from China. <laughs> yeah, so everything you have, nothing you own, nothing that's handmade. I, I can't think of anything right now that it's actually handmade. Yeah, I need scarves. You need scarves. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. A painting, a chair. Yes, ma'am. I have bows. Bows. Yeah. You hand make them up, someone. You got them. You get them handmade. I hand make them. <coughs> Uh, my purse. Your purse is handy. Yeah. A lot of things. My bed frame, my, um, I have glass work at home, mm. paintings, you know, a bunch of stuff. Well, same. I make a lot of blankets and clothing. Art. You. Baskets. Mm. Baskets. Some mm. of the art I paint. Mm. Mm. I have a lot of really creative friends, so I've got a lot of handmade stuff in my house. For example? Uh, art, pottery, dishes, um, mm. costumes, hand beaded jewelry type things, um, and some of our furniture. Um, my mom's an artist, so I have some art from her. I used to knit, I have some pottery, and I used to make jewelry. Um, I have a hand beaded bracelet from Africa that my boyfriend got me. Okay, if you could pick one item, any item, to have it be handmade that you own, what would it be? Any, like pottery? Anything you want. Any, any type of pottery? Any type of pottery. Probably my journal. Interesting. Uh, I guess like furniture, like, like uh, wood. And I lied before because this is handmade. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked down at it. If you had to pick which piece of furniture, if you could pick one and say, you know what, I want to get a new one and it's going to be made by hand. Maybe like a, like a dinner table? Yes, sir. Thinking big, I'm thinking of an automobile handcrafted. <laughs> there we go. Hand ah. restored. <laughs> That's serious. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Pick me some. Um, it could be anything you want. It would be what? A dress. A dress. A painting of my friend. Who would you pick? One, any item you want. Mm -hmm. He stole a card, so I'm going to say. Probably one. Uh, uh, a couch, actually. Make a couch? Yeah. I say food. Yeah, it's temporary, but mm -hmm. it's handmade. Mm -hmm. Painting. I'm gonna go with house. Oh, great. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's serious. Go big or go home. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ma'am. I don't know. I was thinking like a big like comforter or something. I don't know. Yes, I can't use all that. Cool. I'd probably go with a shoe. Or so it's interesting that you know everyone's mentioned um, things that that you know you would either handle or live among or live within or in the case of food I think food is an excellent um, example um, you know take into oneself you know one of the things that Morris observes about about the pleasure that he maintains in the Middle Ages, you know, used to be mixed with labor, is that it's pleasurable for uh, people who use objects produced that way um, to handle them, to, to live among them. And, you know, one of his sayings was that you should not have anything in your home that is not both beautiful and useful. And, you know, I don't think, um, you know, as, as moderns, and, you know, we're all moderns in this room, you know, we can't help it. We're born into the age that, 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 
were born into. And we certainly would not want to, at least I would not uh, want to as a medievalist, you know, get into a time machine like in that movie, that uh, Michael Crichton movie, and go back to the 14th century because there were no antibiotics then and, um, you know, a lot of the food was, was rotten. Um, at the same time, that doesn't mean we can't, you know, learn very valuable lessons from, um, from an age that, um, you know, that is now several, you know, centuries gone from us, but that in, you know, certain ways um, can't be improved on, you know, in terms of this, this ideal of pleasure and labor or, I mean, if you think about the, the medieval attitude towards sin, you know, which is not a popular concept nowadays, right? Um, I mean, there are a lot of things about the Middle Ages that we won't, wouldn't want to reduplicate in the modern age, but I don't think anybody's improved on the idea that all of our problems are due to either pride or avarice, <laughs> self-love, or love of money. All you got to do is open the newspaper or log on to uh, CNN to, to see the truth of that medieval principle displayed. So, um, you know, the, medie the medieval reality you know, we, we only know that by way of fragments, you know, bits of it that survive. But um, the medieval sensibility, that's something that um, in the 19th century they thought that, you know, one could, one could recover. Um, one of my favorite people to read about is a Louisianian, uh, an architect by the name of Henry Hobson Richardson. He was born on Priestley Plantation up toward uh, Destrehan. And as a young man, his, his family uh, moved to the French Quarter, just to the, um, the, the fringes of the French Quarter. Um, his parents sent him in the middle of the 19th century up to Harvard to study, as many southern families did, you know, sent, sent their sons up there um, to the Northeast to study. And he fell in love with French Romanesque architecture, you know, not the pointed arches, but the rounded arches, and he invented a medieval revival form of architecture, um, which came to be called Richardsonian Romanesque. And if you've been on the Tulane campus and seen Tilton Hall or Gibson Hall uh, or Norman Mayor Hall, where the English department is located, <laughs> those were not designed by Henry Hobson Richardson. They were designed by disciples of his at the turn of the century. But he invented that, that form of medieval revival architecture. Um, and I mean, it just spread um, through, uh, through the various states. You know, there um, are Romanesque, uh, Richardsonian Romanesque buildings on the Harvard campus because Richardson, when he came back from, from France, he set up his architectural practice up in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, Chicago has Richardsonian Romanesque buildings. California has buildings inspired uh, by, you know, designed by some of Richardson's disciples. And this is a, you know, this is a way in which the, the medieval spirit in terms of, you know, certain habits and a kind of aesthetic of uh, designing buildings survives into the, into the modern age by way of the 19th century. So these are, you know, some of the things we, we talk about in, in medieval New Orleans. Of course, Mardi Gras is coming up and Mardi Gras you know, Americans didn't invent Mardi Gras. I mean, I know there's this big debate about whether it was invented over in Mobile, Alabama, or over here in New Orleans. In fact, it was invented in Europe. <laughs> um, you know, it originated as something called the Feast of Fools, which was a great, um, you know, kind of elaborate party uh, where everything was turned on its head for a period of time, just before Lent, just before the penitential period in the in the Roman Catholic Church's calendar and uh, you know if you've ever seen the uh, the film The Hunchback of Notre Dame the uh, festival that takes place when Quasimodo you know who is a who is disabled you know is is elevated to the level of uh, king of fools that that festival uh, the Feast of Fools is one of the originals of of Mardi Gras you know so Mardi Gras is a of course, the state we live in is, is heavily influenced by, by its European um, traditions, French, Spanish traditions. 
So we're going to be talking about in, in medieval New Orleans a couple of Monday. I teach um, teach this class on Monday nights. A couple of Mondays hence, we're going to be talking about uh, Mardi Gras and the uh, medieval carnival traditions that that inform it. So there are various ways in which uh, you know I wouldn't say we're we're exactly kind of steeped in the Middle Ages down here in 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 Louisiana and in uh, New Orleans specifically, but certainly. You know, there's a very strong presence of, of medieval traditions in the city that, um, you know, most people, if they're just kind of plugging into New Orleans, um, you know, as tourists, they're not going to, um, they're not going to properly appreciate. But, you know, as residents, we're, we're able to educate ourselves about these and, and really kind of uh, revel, revel in them. Tell us about the book you brought for us. This book, um, can I get up and Absolutely. hold it up? Yeah. Um, so one of the ways in which the Middle Ages influences a city like New Orleans is that uh, certain libraries in, in the city uh, have medieval books in them. That is, that is books that were actually um, handmade and, and copied uh, in the 13th and, and 14th centuries. In fact, I just had a meeting with one of uh, Tulane's there are books librarians and uh, humanities bibliographer this morning about buying uh, a medieval manuscript, that actually a page from a medieval manuscript that's just come on the auction market, and, and we're talking about doing that. But this um, this particular uh, volume now, you know, you couldn't fit that in your pocket like a uh, paperback copy of, say, Joseph Conrad's *The Secret Chair* or, or *Heart of Darkness*, right? I mean, this is this is like a serious serious book. And you can see it's uh, covered in, in leather, and it's got these, these clasps on it. Um, this binding is not medieval. It's a pigskin binding, and these are brass uh, <coughs> clasps, which were common on, on medieval books, way of keeping them shut, Keep, keeping them really uh, shut. Uh, but this, this binding was designed in the 19th century um, by the person who purchased this book uh, in order to mimic or imitate what a medieval binding would look like. Um, you notice the size of the book. This is what's called a, a folio-sized book. It's the largest uh, possible size of a book in the Middle Ages. Very few books are now produced in, in this kind of uh, format. And when you look inside, uh, what you see uh, is, is a text that's all written out by hand on animal skin, on, on parchment. So um, this, this material as a, as a writing surface is much more durable than, um, than the material that uh, we, print, uh, we print books on today on, on, on paper. Uh, you see how white you see how white this is? That's what because it's the inside. That? That's the inside of the animal. If you uh, turn the page, that's the uh, outside of the animal where its uh, fur was uh, before the, the fur was chemically treated and scraped down to make a, a smooth writing surface. So that's hair side, as uh, medieval scholars call it, and that's flesh side, the inside of the animal, which is nice and smooth. Right. Each page uh, represents um, one side of uh, the animal, probably a, uh, a sheep or a calf, uh, you know, who was skinned, and uh, then the skin was treated to uh, prepare it as a as a writing surface. Yeah, somebody had a question back there. Here, yeah. I, I was going to say I like the font size. I can read that from here. Yes, uh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, on your note, you can uh, increase the uh, problem size solved. Of, uh, getting to that stage myself. I'm getting older. Yeah. They didn't have more than I was a kid. <laughs> well, it's very interesting to me. You know, one of one of the fascinating things about talking <coughs> with students for the first time about medieval books is to ask them. And, and you know, one of the great things I think about your teaching style is you know how you start off the class just by you know asking everybody to answer the same question as a way of provoking. Discussion. When I show students medieval books, you know, I don't give them a long lecture about the books before I show them to them. You know, I'll open to, to a page like this, and I'll ask them 
you know, what, what impresses them the most about what they see. And one of the first things they say about a book like this is the size of the handwriting. Mm -hmm. Now, this book was written in a large and formal hand, and it was designed to be in a folio format because it wasn't copied so that one reader could read it. This is what's called a coucher book. You know the phrase couch potato? Or simply the word couch? That comes from a French word, coucher, which means a book stand, a padded stand to put a large book on. This book was designed to be read by a group of people standing in a semicircle around a reading stand where it was opened. And the text that it contains uh, are the Latin texts of the medieval liturgy. So this was a book that was used, I mean, it doesn't have musical notation in it, it has Latin liturgical texts, but it was used in the same way that Urban, you know, some of your sheet music would be used right, on a stand, right, if you weren't playing from memory, uh, if you were performing in concert. This, this book is a text that would have been used for performance and for a particular kind of performance that was central to medieval life, and that was the performance of the liturgy. Now, how would you find your way around in this, in this book? By the fact that some of the text is written in red, that's called a rubric, and it tells you where a particular part of the text begins and ends, where a particular ceremony <coughs> begins and ends, and also these uh, elaborately painted initial capital letters, which are called illuminated capitals and are decorated in uh, gold leaf, as well as in brightly colored paint. Now there's no reason, of course, uh, there's a functional reason to have that large letter there because it you know, captures your attention and tells you that a new section of the text begins here, but there's no functional reason for <coughs> decorating the letter in the way in which it's been decorated. And that's what William Morris was talking about when he talked about the pleasure that medieval workers took in producing objects that were designed for use. This book was designed to be useful, but also beautiful. Those were the two aims in the mind of uh, the scribe and the illuminator, as he would have been called, who, uh, who painted the decorations in, in this book, to make the book useful mm -hmm. and beautiful. So, you know, Morris's, Morris's idea, and Morris collected medieval manuscripts himself. I mean, he was, he was an avid collector of, of medieval books. Most of his medieval books are now in the Pierpont Morgan library in New York City, which is a very large and, and, and wonderful place to work, a rare books library in, in downtown Manhattan. <coughs> but, you know, Morris, um, Morris thought that if modern, that is 19th century and now 20th and 21st century culture could recapture a sense of the relationship between the useful and the beautiful, that a lot of the dehumanizing effects of the Industrial Revolu Revolution could be reversed. So, I mean, one of the one of the great pleasures of, of working with, you know, with, with books like this, which are called manuscripts because they're written by hand. Right? That's what the term manuscript means—a a book copied by hand. You know, one of the great pleasures is um, is really uh, literally being in touch with something that was designed and written in 14th century Italy. That's when this book was made in Italy in the, in the 14th century, and to, to be able to handle it uh, today, to, um, to be able to access it uh, today as a beautiful and useful object is, it's a great privilege and also it's, a, it's an inspiration. So Tulane has you know, a fair number of medieval manuscripts, not, uh, not many complete medieval manuscripts, certainly not as many as the Pierpont Morgan library has, but uh, they're available for, uh, for people's use. Yeah? Um, two questions. Has yep. this book itself been translated? And if so, what is this book about? Like, what is the contents of it? Yeah, this book contains all of the, um, 
Well, this book is actually a fragment. It's part <coughs> of a more complete book that was in circulation in the Middle Ages. Somebody purchased the fragment. A lot of, a lot of medieval manuscripts were broken up after uh, 1500 or so and sold um, to, to collectors in, in parts, basically. So this is a fragment of a medieval missal, but it has various uh, church uh, services, rituals in it. This one right here, beginning A, Asperges, May, the uh, Aspergillium was the uh, stick or the branch that the priest uh, dipped in holy water to bless the congregation. Uh, so this is the Latin ceremony for uh, sprinkling a congregation with holy water and, um, and blessing them. So this would have been pronounced as that were chanted you know, by, by a choir or by a, you know, a group of monks as the, as the priest went through the congregation blessing them. So this is a service book. It's a service book. It would have been used uh, in, in a church to facilitate the performance of, of rituals that were, that were common in the 14th century. Yeah? Um, I, I don't remember my time periods yep. that well, but wasn't the medieval time period a sacred period when it came to music? Absolutely. Absolutely. Trying to appease the church and the yeah. kings. Right, right. And um, it was a type of Gregorian chant, was that it? Yeah, Gregorian chant, um, well, I mean, the story is that it was invented by someone by the name of Gregory, Gregory the Great. Uh, who was also Pope. Yeah. And Gregorian chant was a way of performing music without musical instruments. Right. That is simply using um, the human voice. And it was thought to have a kind of purity and, and precision that, um, that music that was accompanied by instruments did not have. It was called plain chant sometimes yeah. for, for that reason. Polyphony was the singing of a number of different melodic lines at the same time, right, polyphonically at the same time, playing them off against each other, but again, still a cappella without, without musical accompaniment. And that was the, that was the standard of musical performance in, in monasteries in the, in the Middle Ages. We do a thing uh, every class session where I ask uh, the guests the same list of questions. I mean, mm -hmm. You're not going to ask me for like my first pet and social security number or anything <laughs> like that. Huh? That's not... I think you're going to do fine. <laughs> uh, and then we'll open it back up for a few more questions. Yeah, yep. that's great. And, and I'm assuming at the end of class you don't mind if folks come up and take a look at the book? No, in fact, uh, you can come up and you can touch the pages, but not where they've been um, written on, so the margins. Um, one of the reasons why books like this have survived is because in parchment there's collagen, just as there is in, in your skin. And it used to be that they would make you put on white gloves to handle medieval manuscripts like this until they finally realized that the chemicals in the gloves themselves were doing more damage to the parchment than the oils in uh, people's fingers. So you have collagen in your, in your fingers. There's collagen in this parchment that's kept it pliant since the 14th century when this book was written. So um, as long as you don't touch the uh, writing itself, you can uh, turn the pages and, um, and feel the, um, the character of the, of the parchment. Yeah. What is, your, what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Oh, um, hmm. Does it have to be an English word? <laughs> no. Lauda. What does that mean? It means praise. What is your least favorite word? Ah, uh, inferno. That means hell. <laughs> <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, I guess I regard myself as a fairly spiritual individual. I like to meditate every day. And um, when I meditate, I, I usually read a selection from the Book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Um, I do a lot of research on, um, 
one of the earliest translations of, uh, of the Old Testament in English, which date back to the 14th century. And I've, I've kind of found this nice space between my research interests and my meditation interests. Um, so, you know, so I'll read something from, from the Psalms and, um, <coughs> and meditate uh, on that. Usually, well, depending upon my schedule, either at the beginning of the day or at the, at the end of the day as a way of centering myself. Yep. What turns you off? Um, students who uh, pull out their iPhones in class and get distracted. You know, distraction is the enemy, I think, of learning. Distraction is, uh, it's, um, it's a very modern uh, problem. They, ha they had it in the, in the Middle Ages. They didn't just have it in the kind of technologically advanced form in which we do with the, with the iPhone is constantly. Yeah, that's, that's a big turnoff for me. I don't, if I see that in, in class, you know, I want to uh, go ballistic. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word, hmm, Scheisen in uh, German. Which means? It begins with an S and an H. So you can cuss in German, but you can't cuss in English? Well, I, you know, I try not to, uh, try not to <laughs> curse in English if I can avoid it. What sound or noise do you love? What noise? Sound or noise. Do I love? I like the sound of a baby crying. <laughs> What's well, very sound? comforting in a way, you know? I mean, I have two kids. Uh, I mean, they're not babies. Yeah. I mean, they're in their 20s, but I mean, crying, like, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> you, have kids. you have kids. Yeah, I don't You ever been on an airplane where, I mean, I go on some long distance uh, flights, you know, to London, and the baby's crying? You know, for, for about five minutes. That's a very comforting. If it slips over into six or seven minutes, it's... What sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> An adult crying. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Ah. Well, I mean, I, mean, I really love what I do. Um, I would love to be a um, major league baseball pitcher. And my dad had some talent that way. He was, he was in the Army, and when he was on Okinawa, he was, uh, he was an MP at, right at the end of World War II. Uh, shortly before he died, he was going through some old clippings with me, and there were all these clippings about his... Um, you know, one hitters and whatnot for the Army baseball team, and um, and my son has some uh, athletic talent that way, uh, a good arm, and and I've always thought that um, you know, my dad had a trial with the Phillies when he got out of the Army. I thought I've thought to myself, yeah, if I could do something other than than being a college professor, I'd love to be a a pitcher. I mean, a good a good picture. Yeah. What profession would you like not to do? Hmm. Well, hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I've been a lot of things. So, you know, I was a janitor, for instance, before I was a college professor. And I actually enjoyed being a, a janitor because you're kind of left alone, you know, with the buffer in the middle of the night and there's something very centered and gratifying about that, but what would I not like to do? I wouldn't want to be a, a debt collector, you know, or somebody who, who leaned on people for, for financial reasons. Did they have those in the medieval? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um... Hmm. Well, I guess I'd like to be commended for doing a reasonably good job. I know I don't do a perfect one. I mean, at being a human being, not, you know, not being a college professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, welcomed in rather than sent away. <laughs>
Okay. Let's uh, take a few more questions. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you said you did research, like you traveled to research. Can yeah. you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yeah, when I, um, when I was in graduate school, um, I went to graduate school in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, UNC. My daughter is, in fact, in the English program there right now, pursuing her PhD. And my wife and I met there. My wife's a, a PhD as well, but in American uh, literature. She teaches over at uh, Lake Area New Tech Early College High School on Paris Avenue, just <coughs> stone's throw from here. Um, but I guess I was, I was about halfway through my program in, in Chapel Hill, and you know, I went there wanting to study medieval poetry because I'd gotten really interested in it as an undergraduate. I studied at a small Jesuit school in Philadelphia called, it was then called St. Joseph's College, it's now St. Joseph's University, big five basketball school, known for their basketball team. Um, so I was interested in medieval poetry there, then I went off to um, graduate school, and the man who became my dissertation director, George Kane, a fascinating guy, he, um, he was in World War II at the Battle of Dunkirk. He was hurt, uh, he walked with a cane. His name, his name was Kane, K-A-N-E, and he walked with a cane because he suffered this injury in, in the war. He was in a German POW camp for part of the war. And he started telling me some stories about uh, his own research interests and how, um, how they um, became connected directly with the Middle Ages by way of these medieval books that survived. And, you know, I had never worked on medieval manuscripts before, but he encouraged me to apply for a fellowship, and, and I got one for six months to go to Oxford and Cambridge when I was writing my dissertation to, to work on medieval manuscripts. And, and I guess the, the appeal of, of that to me um, has to do with the directness of the connection that you have with the period you're studying through these objects. You know, for instance, I still have, um, you know, my dad had a, was very handy around the house and, and had a lot of tools. And I was just up visiting my mom uh, in, in Philly in October, and she's got, you know, all of my dad's tools out in, in the garage. And, you know, I'm picking up these old <coughs> screwdrivers and wrenches and hammers of his, you know, and the handles are kind of worn down from, from use. My dad was a tool and die worker, um, you know, very skilled manual laborer for most of his life. And it was as if, you know, part of his spirit had kind of rubbed off on these, these objects. And I said to my mom, I said, you know, never give these tools away. You know, I'd like to, you know, when, when you move out of the house, have, you know, have some of them. And um, because, you know, I felt a connection with him through these objects. Well, you know, when you work with books like this, you feel a kind of immediate connection with the period that you're studying that you can't feel any other way. I mean, there are no medieval people alive <laughs> anymore. Um, there are no videotapes of medieval people. You know, there are no um, audio tapes of them singing. Although I do, you know, listen to uh, Plain Chant in the car. It's incre It's a great antidote to road rage. You know, <laughs> listening to uh, Plain Chant and Polyphony in the in the in the car when you're driving around. But to be able to touch a book like this, I mean, it's a great privilege, first of all, to go into these, these libraries in London. You know, I've worked in London, in Oxford, in, in Cambridge, in, in Canterbury, places like that. Then, then here up at Harvard at the Houghton Library, where they have a lot of medieval manuscripts, the Beinecke Library at Yale. Um, but you really feel as if you're in touch with the past. And, and that's a great thing. I think, you know, um, because, you know, in America, I mean, everything is about the new, right? We're always looking for, right, the next iteration of the iPhone, you know, we're always looking for, you know, what's trending, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because, you know, without the new, uh, you know, society would, would remain stagnant. But what's really uh, fascinating to me is, is, is connecting you know, what's really old with what's really new. And, you know, this project that Urban mentioned, Archives and Outreach, where, you know, we bring books like this, you know, over to the high school and let kids handle them. 
you know, when, when I first proposed this, um, you know, people said, oh, wow, you know, they're not trained properly. I said, I think what you will find is such reverence on the part of, you know, kids who are told this was written in the, you know, 14th century. You're going to find, you know, it's going to be so exotic to them, and they're going to feel so reverential toward it. They're going to be, you know, awestruck in a sense by it that you're not going to have any problems of, you know, security or, you know, them mishandling things or not following the rules. And sure enough, that's what we found. I mean, these kids were bowled over, right? By, and we didn't just show them medieval things. We took them to the Amistad collection on Tulane's campus, which is the largest repository of African-American historical uh, documentary history in the country. And they were able to handle um, you know, manuscript poems by Langston Hughes, County Cullen. They were able to open and read a Bible owned by a Louisiana slave, you know? And I mean, when you, when you touch these, these objects that have survived, you know, from the past, you are touching the, the spirit of the people who, who use them, I believe. And, you know, and that's, I mean, I can't think of any, you know, better way to, uh, you know, spend one's life as a, as a researcher. You know, for me, research is not just, you know, it's not like, you know, I mean, I'm not knocking scientific research because it's contributed a lot to my field. You know, it's not just test tubes and whatnot. You know. Last two questions. Um, it's funny that you would speak to that. I had, it for another class, I just read a chapter on whether English was really a discipline. Uh -huh. Is it interdisciplinary or a discipline? And then it fascinates me that a, a lot of what you talked about today was history. And so I was just wondering yeah. your opinions on that. Well, I'm on some uh, task force at Tulane right now called a multidisciplinary task force. Yeah. And we just had a meeting the other day. And you know, a lot of scientists think that what people in the humanities do is not you know, hard research. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you for a fact that you know, working with books like this and making sense out of them is hard research hard in a, in a number of different ways. I mean, it's a, it's a severe discipline to learn all these languages, uh, you know, to learn the, the discourse of describing objects like this. It, it requires just as much training as it requires to become a physicist or a mechanical engineer. Uh, but there's also, you know, another dimension to it as well which enhances it as a discipline, and that is that, you know, to study a book like this, you know, you can't, you can't isolate yourself as a, as a researcher. You've got to be in touch with people who know something about church history. You've got to be in touch with people who know something about liturgical Latin. You've got to be in touch with archivists and librarians who know something about, you know, the long-term uh, care of, of objects like this book. So I think your, your term, interdisciplinary, is, is entirely apt. Uh, to, be, to be a humanist who works with primary sources, you need to be plugged into a network of people who, um, who can bring to bear their own kinds of expertise on, on the questions that are going to arise as you, as you do your work. And for me, that, that's very exciting, I mean, because I really, you know, my colleagues at Tulane, uh, one of the great things about teaching at a university like Tulane is that it's small enough that, you know, I teach courses with uh, medievalists in the art history department. You know, I know as many people in the history and French and Italian and music departments as I know in my own department of, of English. And I think that's really what university life is is all about. You know that that kind of sense of a collaborative enterprise. And now one of the great things about Tulane, especially since the storm, is that we've taken that the next step and really thought about um, you know the entire New Orleans community within which um, you know a university like Tulane is, is situated as an extension of of the university's mission itself. I mean, that's what brought us together in terms of talking about uh, possible collaborations around the anniversary of, um, 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death in, in 2016. I mean, that's how we got to meet. And, um, and I think that that kind of 
interdisciplinarity, that kind of collaboration, that's the future of, of higher education, I think. So I guess your question is, is English a discipline? Well, it was, they were debating whether to put criteria on research and things like that in the article I read. Is English a discipline? It is, yeah. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very strict discipline. You gotta, you know, when, when I learned, <laughs> when I was going off, when I was going off to graduate school, my dad asked me what I was going to study. I said English. He said, "But you know English, Mike." I said, "Well, I said medieval English." He said, "That's different." <laughs> All right. Last question. Was your? I'm assuming you had a minor when you were in school. Yeah. Was it history, art history? I mean, wouldn't you have to have? No, it's interesting. You should I'm ask that. My minor was very deliberately the Renaissance, or what was called at that time the Renaissance. So you know Shakespeare. Um, you know, all of those writers from uh, the 16th century onward up until you get to the 18th century. And what I was interested in in pursuing that period, you know, which for a medievalist is really, you know, it's like contemporary literature to read Shakespeare, you know, for somebody who's trained, uh, you know, in the, in the 14th century. Um, what I was interested in was that, that strange perspective that the Renaissance had on the Middle Ages, that somehow, you know, um, you know, culturally speaking, that that whole period of time was, you know, beneath contempt, and really couldn't compare with, um, you know, the glories of ancient Greece and and Rome. So, yeah. So my second field was a literary field. It was the Renaissance, but there was a program, and in fact, I headed the program at, at Tulane in the 90s uh, when I was first here. And uh, there was a program in Chapel Hill in medieval studies where you would take courses outside of the English department in history and art history. Um, you know, I took a whole sequence of, of classes in old French literature when, when I was in graduate school. Um, so you're right that, you know, to, to get a handle on, on this kind of literature and, and on medieval culture in general, you know, you really have to take a multi, um, multidisciplinary approach to it. Yeah. You wanted to ask? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, a lot of people find a lot of enjoyment out of watching movies that have medieval themes to them. Yeah, um, like Lord of the Rings or... Merlin, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But has Hollywood actually got anything right or have they completely blown it out of prospect? Or uh, some things, it? some things. So yeah. what have they got right? I mean, I teach a... Um, That's a great question. I teach a seminar in the, you know, King Arthur stories and a seminar in the Robin Hood ballads, you know, which are much underappreciated, I think, as, as literary texts by students. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Hollywood does very well in terms of understanding the Middle Ages is this emphasis on its, um, what I would call its otherness, right? The differences between um, you know, the experiences of, of medieval people and, and modern people. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, grittiness about the Lord of the Rings films, for instance, that, you know, if you go back, and I remember watching this uh, film, The Black Shield of Falworth with Tony Curtis when I was a kid, and it's set in the Middle Ages, you know, yonder is the castle of my father, you know, where he's, you know, talking like some, you know, guy from the Ninth Ward, you know, about, you know, dressed up, you know, dressed up like a, like a medieval knight, right? So that, you know, that's not convincing, but if you, you know, um, you know, see these, you know, Peter Jackson movies, there's an effort to suggest something about the kind of uh, roughness of, of medieval life. Um, you know, the best film in this regard, I think, uh, I don't know if you all are familiar with it, is a film with Sean Connery called *The Name of the Rose*. It's an excellent film about um, about the Middle Ages and about medieval monasticism. You know, all, all organized around a murder mystery. The the downside of Hollywood in the Middle Ages is just you know all the CGI that um, you know that computers have made possible. And it's not that you know I like special effects as much as anybody. And you know this dragon. I, I think you know. Benedict Cumberpatch was playing him or something in the last Hobbit movie. You know, it's a really impressive, you know, visual effect. Smog. 
Smog, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> smog. Not that I've seen it. I just, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, you know, at, at first I thought this was supposed to be Cumberpatch in a costume or something, but then, you know, I found out by reading about the movie that really it's just a kind of digital thing with his voice incorporated uh, into it. But, you know, that I think can, can eclipse, you know, some of the sensitivity that modern Hollywood films are able to bring to, you know, an awareness of the roughness of, of medieval life. Because, you know, life was, was very hard in the Middle Ages. You know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is still one of the best films, I think, uh, made about uh, medieval life because it was made on a low budget. And everybody except for the top 1%, maybe it's the same today, you know, lived on a low budget in, in the Middle Ages. You know? Well, let's thank Dr. Kaczynski for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, everybody wants to come check yeah, out the book. Yeah, please do. Feel free. Yeah, come on up. <laughs>